Welcome back, everybody, to CSC 2058. I'm delighted to introduce this morning Garth Gilmore from Instill, a consultancy down in the middle of Belfast. And Garth will probably say a word or two about Instill's work as well, but it's probably fair to say that they train many of the people in the companies that you guys will be going out to work with as well. So I'll let Garth introduce his talk and say a bit about the company as well. Right, thank you very much. Uh, morning, everybody. So uh, my name's uh, Garth Gilmore. Oops. I now have no work. Hold on. Yay, there we are. There. Good. Uh, so my name's Garth Gilmore. I work for a company called Instill in Town. Uh, you will probably hear of us. We do an awful lot of graduate academies and uh, an awful lot of graduate training. So. Um, Instill is primarily a software development business. You know, we have uh, at any time about six to eight teams uh, that are involved in developing software, but we also have a consultancy side of the business. Um, so we do training, mentoring, coaching, uh, all that kind of thing. And uh, that's the, the side of the business that I run. So uh, here's me doing a few talks. Uh, the, the one on the top left, uh, we were doing a course in England and um, at the time, everybody was interested in Kotlin programming. That's uh, that's my main language. So the, the course we were doing was uh, on something completely different, and uh, we were thrown out of the conference room. But uh, a lot of the people said, hey, Garth, can you teach us some Kotlin? And uh, I went, uh, OK, but where will we go? <laughs> so we found a, a pub down the road and said, hey, look, uh, if we keep drinking, can we have control of your PA system? And they went, uh, yeah, sure, yeah. So uh, that was actually in Sheffield. So that was the inaugural meeting of the she uh, Sheffield Kotlin Developers Group, yeah, and uh, you can see the barman there on the right going, "What the hell is going on?" Okay, so um, so yeah, <clears throat> so that's me. Uh, that's Instill. Uh, so as I say, we're mostly a software development company, but we also do the professional services as well. And uh, these are some of the uh, the companies that we work for. Uh, of course, last few years, uh, most of what we've been doing is been doing remote. Uh, especially the teaching, the lecturing, the coaching, uh, all that kind of thing. And uh, just a personal plug, uh, I'm also on the organizing committee for serverless days. Anybody heard of serverless at all? Yay, Grant. Well done, you. Yeah, so uh, so this is a conference that's happening uh, down in Bambridge at the Game of Thrones Center uh, on the 28th of February. So anybody who's interested in AWS, Azure, Google Cloud Platform, anything like that, uh, come talk to me and I'll tell you uh, a little bit about what it is and what we're doing. So uh, the, the goal of this talk, uh, these are 10 things that you're not taught in academia, but will be absolutely vital to you in industry. OK, so uh, this is stuff you really want to pay attention to. OK, I absolutely guarantee it. And uh, these ideas uh, are not mine. You know, they're stolen. And uh, a lot of people have expressed these these ideas on Twitter. Uh, who's on Twitter? Show of hands. Who's on Twitter? For everybody else, who do you have mad political arguments with at 4 a.m. in the morning, you know, without Twitter? Yeah, mad, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, most IT consultants are, are, are on Twitter or these days Mastodon. Yeah. So uh, you want to go out and uh, just lurk. <laughs> you know, there's uh, there's lots of good information out there. And uh, as you know, uh, being in academia, copying from a single source, plagiarism, a bad thing. Copying from many sources, research, completely fine. <laughs> OK, so uh, I've put this talk together by copying lots of other people's uh, good ideas. OK, so uh, good idea number one, uh, version control is your friend. So uh, I know that academia has got an awful lot better since I was in college and, uh, you know, you now do lots of group work and so on. Uh, but last I heard in academia, you spent a lot of time doing uh, single person work. OK, uh, and also, you know, once you submit the assignment, that's it. Yeah. So um, biggest difference between academia and software engineering is that in academia, you may be solving genuinely uh, unknown problems. You know, you may be doing something genuinely for the first time in the world, you know, absolutely pure research. Yeah. Uh, but the good news is you can start from scratch. Yeah. And as you know, if you were doing your PhD, it used to be a very cool thing to create your own programming language from scratch, you know, for uh, for solving the problem. Yeah. And um, whereas in software engineering, 
most of what we do, there are solutions to. OK, so uh, if you're told that you have to build an Android app, well, hopefully, you know, this is the first time you've addressed that business need or at least addressed that business need within your company. Uh, but most of the problems you will encounter to do with creating an Android app, you know, there will be solutions out there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, but whenever you're doing software engineering, well, you're producing solutions. And those solutions have to be maintained for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. And uh, you're collaborating as part of teams. You know, you have to work with uh, a team of 20 or 30 other developers. The software is going to go through a huge number of versions. It's going to be mothballed and so on. OK, so version control is incredibly important. OK, so I cannot stress how important it is for you folks to learn about Git. <laughs> OK, so uh, if you intend to go into software engineering, learn as much about Git as you possibly can. Okay. So as you know, um, for those of you who have met Git before, the idea is that you have commits. Okay. So what's a commit? Well, a commit is uh, a set of one or more uh, deletions of a file, additions of a file, or modifications of a file okay so uh, you have a chain of commits yeah and a chain of commits is what we refer to as a branch yeah and the main branch is logically enough usually called main but you could call it Fred if you wanted yeah uh, and then you have other branches coming off that okay so um it used to be that there were many, many different version control systems used in industry. Uh, these days, everybody's standardized in Git. Okay? So Git was invented by the open source community, but spread like wildfire to just about everybody. OK, so you cannot learn enough about Git. OK, that's uh, lesson number one. OK, uh, lesson number two, find and tighten feedback cycles. Anybody heard of Agile? <laughs> OK, so who's familiar with uh, Scrum or Kanban or feature driven development? Yay! you know, hopefully, hopefully we've all heard about Agile at some point. OK, so uh, what does Agile mean? You know, is Agile a nine? Do we go into a shop and say, I'll have 10 pounds of Agile, please? Uh, no. <laughs> OK, uh, Agile is a verb. Agile is a thing that you do. OK, so what are you doing when you do Agile? OK, what does it mean to do Agile uh, within a software engineering team? OK. Well, here's Kent Beck. Um, if there's like one person that you would point to who was responsible for creating everything these days we call Agile, uh, it would be Kent. OK, so of course, you know, Agile software methodologies are made up of contributions from thousands of, you know, very intelligent people. Uh, but, you know, Kent is probably the one who gets most of the glory. So uh, here's my favorite of Kent Beck's tweets. Uh, it's not the number of hours I work in a day that measures progress. It's the number of feedback loops I complete. OK, and that's the really important thing. OK, so whenever you're doing agile software development, you're trying to find and tighten feedback loops. OK, so um, I bet you one of the easiest things you ever learned was HTML. OK, and why? Uh, is there something inherently easy to understand about angle brackets? No. Uh, you create a .html file, you put in a few tags, you save it, you look at it in the browser. OK. Is it what you expected? Yay. <laughs> OK. Uh, move on to other tags. You know, is it, is it wrong? Damn, you know, go, go change the tags. OK. So whenever you're learning HTML, you're locked into a fast feedback loop, and that's where we learn best. OK. Um, uh, anybody struggled with CSS? Yay, <laughs> okay, because uh, whenever you're doing CSS, you are not in a fast feedback loop, okay? Uh, you make a tiny change and everything, uh, uh, everything just goes nuts in the browser and uh, it takes you forever to work out what the problem was, okay? So uh, we want to be working in fast feedback loops. We want to start with a very simple system and build out from there, okay? Because very, very few systems are built in like, like an act of creative genius where somebody fills the whiteboard with a massive diagram and that proves to be completely right. No, okay? Uh, anything successful, uh, there was a small kernel that worked and then we built out from there, okay? So if you're doing Scrum, Kanban, feature-driven development, whatever you like, you, know, uh, you should be trying to find and tighten feedback loops, okay? So you see there, there's Michael Hill, a uh, very famous agile coach. I absolutely love this. This is what he does when he's doing development and consultancy. Find the nearest, easiest, simplest team felt OE and fix it. <laughs> Lather, rinse, repeat, <laughs> okay? So that's, uh, that's what agile is all about, yeah. So what kind of feedback loops do we have? Who's heard of test-driven development, show of hands? 
Yay! For everybody else, I'm very, very disappointed. Okay, uh, so uh, test-driven development is a way of writing code where uh, we always have a failing test before we go out and uh, and do the implementation. BDD, very similar to TDD, but at a higher level. Uh, various people would shoot me for saying that, but I'll, I can say it. Yeah, uh, having continuous integration, having integration tests having a QA team who are doing security testing, resilience testing, chaos testing, stress testing, you know, uh, these are all examples of fast feedback loops, okay? And then uh, if you're doing Scrum, you'll know that every sprint in Scrum, so every sprint in Scrum, every sprint in Scrum, try saying that 10 times fast, uh, that always ends up in a demo to the customer and uh, a retrospective, you know, where you say, right, uh, what's going well, what's not going well, okay? Right, next one. Um, expect to feel fear and anxiety. Who has felt fear and anxiety whilst coding? Show of hands. I would raise both feet if I could. <laughs> okay, so um, I remember a few years ago, Jamie Oliver was doing this show where he was trying to teach people who couldn't uh, cook how to become chefs so they could work in one of his restaurants. And uh, they were at chef school, yeah. And uh, the coach was saying to them, you know, as they were trying to, to uh, cook a recipe, uh, the fear and anxiety that you feel now, get used to it. You will feel it every night that you do service. You know, every night that you're in the restaurant on call. Okay. So, um, so yeah. So you're going to feel fear and anxiety, especially in software development. You know, software development is a stressful industry. <laughs> okay. So, um, but whenever you go out and you go and you find a company where you want to work, um, it's a bit like Shakespeare. You know, know thyself. Okay, so I've worked for startups, tiny little startups where I was learning a lot. Yeah, but I was driving home past the milk flutes, you know, first thing in the morning. Yeah, and uh, I've worked for really large companies where you were, uh, you know, you weren't being stressed out, but you weren't being pushed, you weren't being learning anything, but it was, you know, a comfortable existence. Okay, um, but, you know, it's up to you folks to find the level of stress that you're comfortable with. Okay, but don't get too comfortable. Okay, um, anybody done business studies? Any Know the the buggy whips metaphor anybody know what that means hey cool so um at one point there were lots of companies that were selling buggy whips and then bit by bit they went out of business yeah and uh, why didn't the buggy whip companies work out that everybody was buying cars you know well at the time they were saying oh these big nasty horrible cars with the smelly petrol that will never replace the the good old horse and carriage yeah so uh if you're really really comfortable and you've been using the same programming language and technology set for for 10 years and so on well well done you yeah uh but the problem is you might be in a buggy whip company you know, because we work in an industry uh, that reinvents itself every five years or so. Yeah. So um, you can usually miss one or two of those cycles and still have a, a viable career, you know, skill set. Yeah. Uh, but if you miss more than two, then you're in trouble. OK, sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me counterbalance that a little bit with number four. Social skills matter. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you find that um, whenever software developers are young, and you folks all look disgustingly young to me. Uh, so uh, whenever you're young, uh, you're obsessed with the tools of your craft and that's fine, okay? So you're obsessed with um, programming languages and libraries for machine learning and uh, what the, the coolest IDE at the minute and whatever it happens to be. And that's completely fine, okay? Uh, but the more senior you become, uh, the more you realize that in industry, at least most of the technical problems have been solved, okay? As I say, in software engineering, there are very few IT companies that are doing genuine research. You know, that's pretty much left to the academics. Yeah. So what's the tricky thing? People. People are the problem. <laughs> OK, so uh, engaging with other developers, engaging with the business analysts. Yeah. Engaging with your deepest, darkest enemy, the QA people whoops, um, who are uh, one floor. Up, <laughs> OK, or um, maybe the enemy who's even worse than that. The customer. customer. You know, so. Uh, yeah, uh, but obviously that's not how it should be. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the, this is the kind of trap that you can fall into. OK, so uh, j just touching on agile once again, what does it mean to be an agile team? OK, well, do a little exercise for me. OK, in a minute, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and I'm going to say a phrase and I just want you to capture the image that comes into your head. OK, everybody close your eyes, right? A mathematician. Everybody open your eyes. OK, so. 
who in their mind's eye saw a single person working at a whiteboard, you know, or something like that? Who, who saw something like that? Yeah, but people usually do. OK, so uh, uh, software engineering is supposed to branch off computer science. Computer science is supposed to branch off mathematics. Mathematics is all about individual genius. OK, software engineering, I assure you, is not. <laughs> OK, so uh, software engineering is a team sport at the end of the day. OK, and uh, it's not even like an orchestra, because in an orchestra, let's say you play the violin. OK, so you play the violin. And if the percussionist is sick that day, too bad. <laughs> OK, that's not your problem. You play the violin. OK, whereas if you're working in software, um, uh, engineering in an agile team and you're a developer and the QA person is sick, you do QA, <laughs> you know, or uh, if there's no development to be done today, you do uh, testing or you write documentation or whatever it happens to be. OK, so if you're looking for a good metaphor for an agile team, it should be a jazz band. OK, and in a jazz band, it's a bit like doing improv. Anybody ever done improv, you know, live and stage, uh, anything like that? It's great fun, you know, but you know, good. Yeah. So one of the rules of improv is that you always accept what you're given. OK, so let's say you're doing a sketch and you're going from person to person and the person before you decides that you're on Mars. OK, well, you can't turn around and say, no, that's nonsense. We're not on Mars. You are on Mars. You know, you you accept what you're given. OK, you keep moving forward. Yeah. So in the same way, uh, in an agile group, um, it's a bit like a jazz band where you're all ripping off one another and giving, uh, trying to make the best of the notes you've been given and so on. OK, and it's imperfect. OK, but that's uh, that's part of the fun. OK, so yeah, so it's all about collaboration. OK, so as you get uh, further on and more senior uh, in your career, the more you're going to have to work on your people, people skills. OK, and this is actually something we're working on at Instill at the moment. Uh, we're coming up with a, a pile of courses on individual leadership, you know, for junior developers, how to work with stakeholders, how to go into a meeting and present your case, uh, how to negotiate, how to understand the requirements that you're given, basically how to behave like a professional, <laughs> you know, so we're getting uh, lots more demand for that kind of training. So we still do all the technical stuff, yeah, um, but there's uh, a lot more demand for leadership skills these days, okay? And uh, a modern touch, yeah, this is even more important these days, Anybody tell me what that is? I'd be amazed if you did. Yeah, uh, we did like a, an ML hackathon uh, the other day, and I just put in trilobite Scooby-Doo. OK, do not ask me why. <laughs> OK, uh, but I went up to one of the ML image generators and I said, I'd like trilobite uh, Scooby-Doo, please. And uh, that's what it came up with. <laughs> OK, so. Um, at the moment, there's this obsession that ML tools uh, are going to take our jobs. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, you know. Uh, but definitely, there's an awful lot of interest at the moment in low code solutions. OK, so again, quick show of hands. Who's familiar with the low code, no code movement? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. So uh, this is something that comes around every decade. And for the past three decades, I've made fun of it. OK. This decade it might actually work. <laughs> OK, so low code is just where uh, you can build a complete solution uh, end to end from soup to nuts. And you're not actually writing code in the traditional sense. Yeah, what you're doing is you're dragging and dropping some kind of workflow diagram or you're given a series of boxes that represent steps and you you fill out the details and so on. OK, so there's a whole pile of different variations on the theme, uh, but basically it's coding without coding. <laughs> OK, so this idea comes round every decade. Yeah, and it's failed for about three or four decades running. OK, so grey beards like us. Yeah, will remember case computer assisted software engineering and then uh, executable UML um, and then um, enterprise service buses and then web service orchestration and workflow engines. And, <laughs> you know, I, I could do a whole lecture on it, which none of you should ever attend. OK, uh, but uh, this is an idea that keeps coming around. Yeah, but this time it might actually work. OK, and sort of who's seen sneakers? Who's seen sneakers the movie? Oh, don't make me feel old. Somebody must have seen sneakers. OK, Sneakers is an amazing movie. There's your homework. You all have to watch Sneakers this weekend. OK, uh, so absolutely amazing movie. And you've got the, the protagonist and then the antagonist there saying, you know, everything in the world, including money, 
operates not in reality, but the perception of reality. OK, so the industry increasingly believes that these low code, no code tools will work. OK, and the fact that they believe it is in a sense all that matters as a junior developer. OK, because if you get through and onto one of those projects, well, then what's going to differentiate you from your colleagues is not your technical skills. Yeah, but your uh, your social skills, your personal skills, you know, that kind of thing. Right, moving along. Oh, halfway through, I should really say, any any questions so far? Throw, throw out questions at any time, I should have said. Yeah, and uh, we'll finish in time for questions at the end. And if you're feeling shy, you can always grab me afterwards. I'll be here for another 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Right, so number five, uh, performance matters, or does it? <laughs> okay, so performance is unique. It's one of those things that in software engineering, everybody, you know, they, they swear fealty to it. They say, I'm going to write high production code. You know, I'm going to write the, the fastest code possible. OK, so first of all, if you talk to a performance analyst, they'll they'll get really angry. OK, because nobody really understands what performance means. OK, or rather when a developer says, I want to make my code faster, usually they don't have a clue what they're talking about. OK, so what do you mean by performance? You know, do you mean latency? OK, the time it takes to get a response to a request. OK, do you mean throughput, the total number of items that are processed per, per millisecond or microsecond or second or whatever? You know, uh, do you mean the scale? Availability. Do you mean degradation? How performance uh, starts tailing off when we get overloaded? Do you mean utilization? Very important these days. Yeah. If you write a piece of software and it runs blazingly fast on a one core machine and then you put it onto a four core machine and it runs slower, well, then you've got a problem. <laughs> OK, so in this era of distributed network systems in the cloud with multiple cores and so on, it's very important that your software scales to utilize the resources that it's given. OK, the, the fact that it's blazingly fast in the lab doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be blazingly fast when you deploy it onto real world hardware. OK, so um, yes, performance matters, but not half as much as people think it does <laughs> in most situations. OK, and then there are the few situations where it's absolutely everything that matters. OK, and usually when people talk about performance, especially developers, they're talking about it in a weird, fuzzy way where they don't have a clue what they're doing. OK, so it's perfectly normal to find programmers agonizing agonizing over the choice of language and the choice of loop and all this kind of thing. And then you look at the code that they've written and they're actually repeating the same database query 10 times you know, when they know for certain no new data was added into the database. OK, so uh, uh, that completely dwarfs any issues about choice of loop or choice of language. Yeah. And um, have you heard the joke about uh, uh, there's a bar and it's throwing out time? So people uh, are walking out of the bar and there's this guy scrabbling, scrabbling under the uh, the street light and they go, what's the problem? And he goes, oh, I dropped my keys somewhere in the car park. And they go, well, why are you looking on, under there? And he goes, well, the light's better, <laughs> you know, so uh, performance is like that. You know, developers understand code, so they try and optimize the code. But these days, again, if you're deploying to AWS or Azure or something like that, and it's a heavily networked application and there's lots of requests between services and against the data store and code is separated between the UI and the server and all that kind of thing. Well, you know, as I say, your choice of loop is probably not going to be where the performance issues are. Yeah. Uh, next thing relating to coding. Uh, the better a developer you get, the simpler the code you write. OK, so who here ever learned a programming language and you went through a stage of wanting to show off every feature possible in that programming language? Show of hands. Anybody? Or you'll all go through it. <laughs> OK, so uh, as software developers, we get better and better and we naturally want to show off our skills. OK, so I remember as a junior developer writing Java code where I wanted to show off generics and I wanted to show off reflection and I wanted to show off dynamic class loading and aspect oriented programming and all of this stuff, you know, uh, until I got metaphorically beaten up in a code review, <laughs> you know, so uh, the, the the experienced developer writes the simplest code possible, OK? But writing the simplest code possible is tricky, OK? And that's why we refactor, OK? So refactoring being the process of cleaning up your code, OK? But uh, the point of this item here is that you can only wear one hat at a time, OK? So who here has ever come in uh, to a piece of code that you've written to add a new feature, OK? And then you say, oh, that function's got a horrible name and you change that. 
and you say, oh, that function's too long and you split it in two. And you say, oh, I should really move that to a different file and you do that. And then for the love of goodness, you cannot remember why you came to the code base in the first place. <laughs> OK, uh, anybody ever had that happen to them? Yay, yes, yeah, so it's a really, really common thing. OK, so the way the agile coaches like to explain it, uh, there are two hats. Yeah. The first hat is the get the damn thing working hat, okay? And this is where you're frantically coding and coding and coding and coding and coding, yeah? And uh, you're trying to get that data in the database or that thing on the screen or whatever. Uh, you are after the result, okay? And uh, in the name of getting the result, you commit terrible, terrible crimes, okay? Uh, you give things terrible names. You write functions that are far too long. You duplicate code all over the place, okay? And I'll tell you a secret. We all do it. OK, uh, but once you've got the result, yeah, that is where the professional takes a deep breath. He or she takes a, you know, a walk around the block, metaphorical or literal. Uh, and then you come back and you put on your refactoring hat. Yeah. And then you tidy up the code. OK, so uh, we all code with two hats. Yeah. And uh, do both. <laughs> Write your code and refactor your code, but don't wear both hats at the time. At the, at the same time, okay? And uh, this is an awful lot like uh, creative writing. Uh, if you talk to any author, uh, they'll give you the standard advice, and this applies to writing uh, a research paper or a book or whatever, which is that in the first draft, yeah, uh, just brainstorm and put down everything. Uh, if anybody been in a, on a writing workshop where they teach you how to be a professional writer, yeah, um, they'll do all these exercises where they'll say, right, uh, you know, you have to write... Um, uh, a paper about being a goldfish on Mars, okay? And uh, you've got one minute to write, start writing, okay? Try not to think, just put down all your ideas, just flow, 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 you know? And then see what you've got at the end of that minute and then see if there's any good ideas in there, okay? So if you're doing creative writing, the idea is that you brainstorm in your first draft, yeah? And then in your second draft, you'd be absolutely ruthless. You know, you, you kill your darlings, as they say, you know, and uh, you pretend that you knew what you were doing all along, okay? So whenever it gets down to creative writing and programming, uh, they're actually very similar. You know, we have these, uh, these two hats, okay? So I love this line here. Programming is like wizardry, but the kind where the better a wizard you are, the less magic you use, okay? So the more senior a developer you become, the more simpler, easier to understand, maintainable your, uh, your code should be, okay? Uh, next one, naming is everything, okay? Uh, I love this website, uh, When Cakes Go Wrong. They, uh, it now has a, a couple of other, you know, competitors as well, but it's just all things that go wrong when people are ordering cake, okay? So first of all, they might just miss here, yeah? So it's a grill, <laughs> possibly it's a grill, yeah? Um, uh, and then top right, they might just not care, <laughs> okay? So uh, they do exactly what they've been told, so good luck, luck Jerry, with sad faces, okay? Uh, then on the bottom left, it gets metaphysical. I want sprinkles. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then uh, on the bottom right, this is a thing that's happened multiple times. Uh, the story I heard was that there was a company where the boss was retiring and they went to one of those shops where they could ice a photo onto the cake and they had a photo of the boss teeing off on the golf course. Yeah. So that's what they wanted iced onto the cake. So you can imagine what happens. Somebody in the cake shop shouts, what's going on the cake? You know, and somebody shouts back, it's on the counter. Yeah. So they were very literal and just iced a photo of the uh, the memory stick onto the cake. OK, so my point is that if these are all the things that can go wrong whenever people order cake, yeah, imagine all the things that can go wrong whenever people are uh, building software. OK, so you have to recognize, yeah, that let's say you come out of QUB as the best damn Java developer on the planet, okay? Or the best damn C-sharp developer or whatever it happens to be, okay? And then you go into a job in the telecoms industry or in derivatives trading or in insurance or whatever the hell it happens to be, okay? Well, uh, you are an absolute newbie. You are an absolute beginner, okay? Because in that world, they will have their own language. You know, they will have their own terminology, okay? So um, I used to do a little bit of consultancy for a company that that developed software for derivatives traders. I used to help with their graduate academy. And uh, on the first morning, at great expense, a real world derivatives trader was flew over from London. Yeah. And he gave people a three hour overview of the derivatives industry and all the terminology. Yeah. 
people left that room looking like they'd been mugged. <laughs> yeah, because the amount of specialized terminology they'd been given and uh, the way it fitted together and so on and order books and bids and asks and trades and all this kind of thing, um, that, that they just knew that they couldn't keep it in their heads. It was complicated. OK, so it will take you years to get familiar with the terminology of a particular uh, problem domain. OK, so language is really, really important. OK, there is the language of software engineering. There is the language of whatever industry you go into. OK, and language is really, really complicated and really subtle. OK, so uh, I recommend, you know, for your own professional uh, development, take an interest in linguistics. OK, here's two really, really good books in the subject. OK, language is far, far, far more complicated than most of us think it is. OK, so that's why. Um, there's a whole kind of subset of agile development called domain driven design. OK, the original book is on the left. The book I would recommend you read is on the right. <laughs> OK, uh, who's heard of DDD, domain driven design? Anybody? Oh, add that to your reading list. OK, so uh, the, there are two big ideas in DDD. I'll try and explain them in two minutes. OK, uh, big idea number one build a ubiquitous language. What's a ubiquitous language? Well, this is just where we as software developers have our terminology, yeah, uh, but the customer also is their terminology, okay? So derivatives trading, once again, I'll make it a bit satirical, but let's say you go up to the derivatives traders and you say, look, I know that you deal in futures, and bids and asks and trades and all this kind of thing, but for the purposes of this system, you know, we're just gonna use the word stock, if that's okay, because developers are simple people, okay? So we're just gonna use the word stock. Can we agree on that, okay? And then you go to the software developers and you say, okay, I know that you deal in priority and version and live lock and deadline and threading and parallelism and coroutines and all of this stuff, yeah. Um, but, you know, the, the traders are simple people, okay? So can we just use the word task? You know, for the purposes of this system, is it good enough to use the word task? You know, and they say yes, okay? So the idea is that we can simplify at either end and we build a ubiquitous language, you know, the language that we are going to use in this project. And once we have agreed on that ubiquitous language, we use it absolutely everywhere in all the names of things in the code, in all the comments, in all the documentation, in all the, the discussions with the client. You know, you get the idea. So that's the first big idea that the ubiquitous language. The second one is that there's more than one ubiquitous language, OK? Because as you go around a particular company, you will discover that they see the world in different ways, OK? So consider the word order, OK? To an order, uh, all a salesperson cares about is the commission. You know, that they get the order out the door, they get money, <laughs> OK? So uh, if you say order to a salesperson and you could open up their head and look inside, uh, you know, that the word commission would be flashing, you know, in their neural net, you know, in their mental map, OK? Uh, on the other hand, one of my friends works as a warehouse manager. If you say order to him, he'll think, OK, how many things are they in stock? How heavy are they? Where do they have to go? <laughs> OK, um, if you had somebody who was involved in accounting, yeah, and you said order, they really don't care about whether the order is worth 50p or 50,000 pounds. OK, all that matters is when does it need to be delivered by? When is the, the customer going to pay for it? What are the payment terms? What is the credit worthiness of the customer and so on? OK, so the same words mean radically different things in different um, bits of the company. OK, and that's what we refer to as a bounded context. OK, so a bounded context is just a box where the ubiquitous language works, okay? And it might be very, very simple. You know, you might go from the sales team to the accounting team to the warehousing team, whoops, sorry again, and uh, go from ubiquitous language A to B to C, okay? Uh, but it's rarely that easy. You know, usually everybody in the company is on the same floor, and by moving three feet, <laughs> you know, uh, from one desk to another, you cross the bounded context, you know? So I've done workshops in this, where you have people who've sat beside each other for 10 years, you know, in the same department of the same company, and they turn around and go, oh, that's what you think of by that. That makes sense now. You know, I've always understood it as something completely different. Okay. So whenever you're developing the software, 
getting that right is obviously terrifyingly important. OK, so d domain driven design is all about that. OK, domain driven design is all about finding the different ubiquitous languages that exist, you know, and creating your own and uh, working out what the bounded contexts are. OK, and this is actually a very hands on thing. You know, um, if you go and look up event storming as a modeling technique, uh, event storming workshops, it's a really fun thing to do. So, so go and do some research on that and uh, have a play. It's really interesting. Uh, number eight, functional programming is the future. OK, so if you think about all the different programming languages that are out there, if a programming language didn't have support for functional programming 10 or 15 years ago, they started adding it really quickly. OK, and why should this be? OK, well, as you know, we started off in procedural programming and then we went to object oriented programming. OK, and why do we do OO? Long story short, OO lets us program in teams. OK, so using object oriented programming, you can write a class or a component and I can use it without caring about how it's implemented. OK, by the way, who's doing OO programming at the moment? Show of hands, who's learning or programming in an OO language? Yay, cool. So how do you know if you're doing OO right? OK, well, the answer is uh, let's say you write an employee class and give it to me if I can use it without understanding the internal implementation then you've done your job right okay on the other hand if you come up uh, sorry if I go up to you and I say I can't understand how calc salary works and you say ah well you have to understand that inside the employee object the salary is actually held as three fields and one of them's a double and one of them's an int and you know yada yada failure <laughs> yeah or uh, if uh, if I say to you I can't understand calc salary and you need to say ah well you need to understand that this is the algorithm this is the accounting algorithm that we use for calculating the salary failure okay so the the litmus test of OO is that you give me a type and I should be able to use it without having any concern about how it's implemented. OK, of course, I still need to understand the abstraction. OK, I still need to understand what an employee actually is. <laughs> OK, but beyond what we've defined, you know, the, the basics of what an employee is through our domain driven design, you know, I shouldn't need to know anything else. So OO is great for letting us work in teams. OK, but going forwards, we're all writing code that runs in multi-core hardware, OK? And OO really doesn't help with parallel programming, OK? So going forwards, because of multi-core, because they can't print the circuits any smaller, yada, 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 uh, you know, we all need to become programmers in some way, shape or form. OK, and it turns out that the functional programming style is incredibly helpful with that. OK, so functional programming has been around for a lot longer than, oh, oh, you know, it's uh, it's flourished in academia, but it really wasn't of interest in, to the industry until multi-core became a big thing, you know. Uh, so the uh, the industry kind of woke up to the advantages of functional programming, OK? So every programming language that wasn't functional became functional, OK? So anybody doing Java, Java 8 or beyond uh, using the, the Streams API? Yep, there you go. So that's a, that's how they added functional programming to Java. Uh, anybody doing C Sharp and um, programming with Link? Who's, who's familiar with Link and C Sharp? Anybody? No, look that one up. That's, a, that's how they do functional programming and so on. And then all modern programming languages are functional OO hybrids. OK, so in the world of .NET, you've got C Sharp. Yeah, uh, in the world of Java, you've got Kotlin and Scala. Uh, as successors to C++, you've got things like Rust. Yeah, on the Mac, you've got Swift, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> OK, so um, any, uh, any new programming language, any language that's come along in the last decade or so, it's an OO functional hybrid. OK, so you, can, you know, learn FP, definitely learn FP. OK, uh, here's some books that will help. Yeah, uh, the one in the top left, I cannot recommend enough. OK, Professor Frisbee's Mostly Adequate Guide to Functional Programming. OK, it's great fun and it's available for free. <laughs> OK, and uh, it just uh, it takes JavaScript all the way through. Because it says, look, JavaScript is the, the lingua franca. You know, it's the uh, language that most readers are expected to be either familiar with. Yep. Or, you know, that they can make sense of it through C or Java or C Sharp or whatever. Yeah. And it starts from absolute basics and it ends up with really advanced uh, concepts. So it takes you up to uh, monadic composition and uh, event systems and stuff like that. You know, so it's uh, well worth having a look at. 
Okay, and um, it actually turns out that OO and functional programming aren't completely different. They're just mirror images of one another. Okay, so um, there, there's a famous IT consultant called uh, Kevlin Henney. Uh, if you put that name into YouTube, you'll get the phone book. He's done uh, an awful lot of talks. Yeah, and um, this one here is particularly good, you know, where uh, he just carefully explains how OO programming and uh, functional programming are mirror images of one another. Okay, they're not enemies. Yeah, they're not completely unrelated. They're much more closely related than you think. OK, so I really, really recommend that. Too. Um, so coming near the end, only two to go. Uh, number nine, very important one for when you go into industry and feel the fear, because uh, it used to be that um, uh, in the beginning, I was a, a, a C developer and then a C++ developer. And then for 10 years, we entered the uh, the era of Java or C Sharp. <laughs> OK, so basically, uh, it's a bit like the Atreides and the Harkonnens. Yeah. Who knows what I'm talking about when I say the Atreides and the Harkonnens? Show of hands. Oh, go watch June. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yes. Yeah, so um, there was the enterprise Java platform, still is, and there was the .NET platform. OK, uh, so you're either a Java developer or a C Sharp developer, and that was it. OK, these days, there's an absolute blizzard of programming languages out there. If you think back to that slide uh, I put up a minute or two ago, let me just go back. There's a whoops. There's a zillion different programming languages out there. You know, these are just the main ones that people use or used to use. You know, uh, when you go out into industry, you'll be bombarded with lots of different programming languages. Yeah, but the good news is they're all converging on the same set of features. OK, so there are a zillion different programming languages out there, but there are only so many good ideas. <laughs> OK, and as programming languages converge, that they're all coming to the same conclusion. OK. So, for example, uh, let's say you're doing scripting. OK, well, then uh, you might say let M and M is a variable, but that variable could be a string and then it could hold a number and then it could hold a Boolean and so on. OK, so you could be doing dynamically typed programming or weak typing if you were very unlucky. Yeah? But then uh, you could move to uh, to strong typing. Yeah. And uh, that's what you'd be doing in Java or C sharp. Yeah. Where you might say mutant M equals new mutant. OK. Uh, so anybody ever wondered why you need to put the word mutant uh, on both sides? No, so, so I've been teaching Java and C Sharp for 20 years. And um, there's a, a, at some point, somebody always says, you know, why do I have to write employee E equals new employee? You know, why do I have to use that the word employee twice? OK, and the answer is, of course, it was good. It's good enough for the generation before you and the generation before that and so on. So shut up and eat your mush. You know, uh, so it actually turns out yeah, that there is no good reason. Yeah. So what we can do is we can do type inference. Yeah. So we can say val m. Yeah. And then the compiler can work out that m is a mutant. OK, because you're pointing it at a mutant object. So therefore, m should be a mutant. Yeah. And then why do we need new? You know, in Java and C sharp, why do we need new? OK, well, because they stole their syntax from C++. And in C++, there were two places you could create an object. OK, so if you said new, you were creating at one place. If you didn't, you were creating it somewhere else. OK, so Java and C sharp kept the new, but the new isn't actually required. Yeah, so let's just drop the new. You get the idea. OK, so all programming languages are coming together. OK, so let's write the same program in a couple of different languages. Uh, anybody programmed in Scala? Oh, have a look at Scala. Scala is great. OK, so here is the, uh, the, the Scala programming language. Yep. So you see here at the top, I declare a class called person. And in that class, we're going to have a single field called name. So whenever you create a person object, there will be a single name field in there. And then we write a function called display and the function called display will uh, take a person and print out to the console person called and then the person's name. And then we'll have our main function. And in the main function, we'll create a list of strings, uh, Dave, Jane, Pete and Lucy. And then using the tools of functional programming, we'll take that list of strings, convert each one to a person object and then call display, you know, for, for each person object. OK, so uh, Scala is a really nice language because its explicit purpose you know, is to give you the whole OO toolkit and the whole functional toolkit. OK, so Scala tries to give you um, 
all the OO stuff and all the functional stuff. OK, that is its biggest advantage. It is also its biggest problem. <laughs> OK, so it's a great language to to learn in. It's a great language to play around in. It also lets you shit yourself in both feet. OK, or to be more accurate, blow off both of your legs. <laughs> OK, but, uh, you know, really interesting language. Very cool and trendy. Yeah. Uh, let's say we wanted to do it in Kotlin, OK, my, my personal favorite language. Yeah. Uh, another more modern version of Java. Yeah. Well, then you see we create a class called person. We have our function called display. We have the main function. We use the tools of functional programming. OK, so a few you know, bits and bobs of the syntax aside, it's practically the same thing. OK, uh, let's say we're doing TypeScript. Anybody heard of TypeScript? Yay, cool. So TypeScript is Microsoft's enhanced version of JavaScript. Very, very cool. OK, uh, and then still uh, we try and do everything in either TypeScript or Kotlin. You know, those are our two main programming languages. Yeah. So uh, let's say we were doing TypeScript and we want to have our person class yeah, with a single field called name. We want to have a display method that logs out the, uh, the name of the person. We want to create a, a list of strings and then using the tools of functional programming for each string, we want to create a person and then we want to call display, you know, on each of the person objects. Yep, there you are there. Again, almost exactly the same. And even Java, <laughs> OK, even good old Java. OK, so in modern Java, we can do practically the same thing. OK, so we have a class called program because this is Java, yeah, and uh, a code has to go inside classes. But even that, uh, I think in Java 19, maybe, uh, it will be possible to write a very simple program outside of a class. You know, you won't need to surround Hello World with a class anymore, yeah. But for the moment, you know, we need to declare a class called program. But inside there, we can have a record called person, and that will have a field called name. And then uh, we'll have our display method. We'll have our main function. Inside our main function, we'll create a list of strings. And then using the tools of functional programming, we'll create a person for each string and then display them. OK, so uh, you see there we're, we're saying dot stream. We're using the streams API. So in Java, you can create a, a stream of items, a conveyor belt of items. Yeah. And against that conveyor belt of items, you can use all the tools of functional program. So what I'm trying to give you from that example here is that it's pretty much the same. OK, so all the major programming languages are converging on the same set of ideas. OK, so um, whenever you go into industry, don't be completely freaked out by the number of programming languages out there. Yeah, uh, be reassured by the fact that they're all converging together. Okay. And then finally, uh, five minutes and, and then we'll be done. Uh, the jungle is neutral. What? <laughs> OK, so. Um, Whenever I was uh, uh, I was younger and had time to to read anything I wanted, uh, I was really into military history. Yeah, and there's this really good book, The Jungle Is Neutral. Yeah, and uh, it's about uh, a bunch of soldiers who were left behind uh, enemy lines in Borneo in uh, in World War Two, and uh, ha had to fight a guerrilla campaign uh, with very few resources. Okay, and the clues in the title, The Jungle Is Neutral. Okay, the the whole point of the book is that if you're alone. In the jungle, the jungle will give you everything you need. You know, the jungle will shelter you. The jungle will feed you and clothe you and provide you with the resources to make tools and so on. OK, on the other hand, uh, if you lose faith and self-confidence, if you neglect your personal hygiene or you get cut and you don't take care of the cut, et cetera, et cetera, then the jungle will literally eat you alive. <laughs> OK, so that's a that's a good metaphor for for the industry. OK, so software engineers are professionals or we want to be professional people. OK, and just like doctors and lawyers and so on, we need to manage our own career. OK, so if you were a doctor and you wanted to be a surgeon or you wanted to run a hospital or if you're a lawyer and you want to end up being a partner or running your own law practice. Yeah, well, then uh, you have to take care of your own personal development. OK, nobody's going to do it for you. It's up to you. OK, so the software industry is a brilliant place. Yeah, it reinvents itself every five years. So as I say, that means it's like a merry-go-round. <laughs> OK, so that you know, every five or 10 years, there's the opportunity to just step onto the merry-go-round because suddenly the experience of all the developers in the industry has been massively devalued. OK, so for example, when
whenever we moved to cloud computing, cloud computing solved the problem of having to host your own server farm and having to manage those servers and worry about things going down or resources being starved or whatever it happened to be. OK, so an awful lot of people who were like specialists in uh, creating and managing server farms, you know, on prem uh, for for big companies, suddenly they were out of a job. <laughs> OK, uh, but that, that has a good, a good edge to it, as I say, because it's like the merry-go-round. OK, every five or 10 years, the knowledge that professional software developers have becomes massively devalued. And you as a newbie to the industry, you can step onto the merry-go-round. <laughs> OK, and uh, you're in a, a really good position to to compete with the more experienced people. OK, but you have to keep working on your professional career. You know, you have to keep focused uh, on improving your skill set. You cannot rely on your employer to, to spoon feed you. It is not a pure meritocracy. OK, don't let anybody tell me that it is. OK. Right. So uh, having done my best Will Sergeant impression there, uh, let's uh, let, let's finish off. OK, so in summary, Version control is crucially important, whatever you do, okay? So if you're going into software engineering, you cannot learn enough about Git, okay? Start learning now, okay? Uh, all of Agile is about working in feedback cycles, finding them, tightening them, and so on. It's okay to be afraid. Everybody's afraid all the time, okay? Uh, in the long run, social skills are more important than programming skills. Performance is something everybody talks about all the time, um, but uh, it's very much of a, uh, a mirage, you know, except when it isn't, and it's absolutely vitally important. Okay, so performance is a, a tricky thing. Okay, uh, write code with two hats. Yeah, the get the damn thing working hat and the refactoring hat, but never wear the same two at the, at the time. Okay. Uh, naming is everything. Learn about domain driven design. Uh, it's relatively easy to learn. It's incredibly important. OK, uh, the functional style is at least as important as the UO style and these days potentially more. So um, if you haven't covered FP in your college courses, go out and learn about it yourself. Yeah. Uh, programming languages are converging. OK, there are a gazillion different programming languages out there, but they're all starting to agree to converge in the same set of features. OK, so work out what that set of features is and get very uh, confident in it. Yeah. And then finally, the jungle is neutral. OK, the only person who's going to look out for you and manage your own career uh, is yourself. <laughs> OK, the, the software industry is filled with really nice, friendly, helpful people. Yeah, uh, but you, know, you can't depend on that at the end of the day. You know, you've got to be a professional like a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, and uh, take charge of your own career in the, uh, the long term. So that's it. Uh, that's my show. Any uh, any questions? Are you all going to be shy students? Going once, going twice. So, OK, shyness wins, OK? Uh, but if you want, please feel free to come down and uh, talk to me afterwards. But uh, thank you very much indeed.